Dr. Keith Matheny is a private practice otolaryngologist like myself who found a way for practices across the country to synergize and benefit without losing any autonomy. And if you listen to the end, he'll give you a great pearl on what you should do first if you have a great idea for a medical device. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a show by me, Dr. Bradley Block, and this is a practical guide for practicing physicians where we interview experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Dr. Keith Matheny, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Brad. I'm glad to be here. So we're going to be talking about... um, a couple of the, a couple of the companies that you've started. Who who does that? Who's who's a full time practicing physician and starts and starts multiple companies? So U.S. Uh, ENT Partners and Sleep Vigil and among other things that you've done. Right, you've got a number of patents. So that's like the short short version. Can you give us just a little bit of a longer version of 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 who you are? Well, the answer to your question is someone who's absolutely insane. Right, it's it's not not enough to just be a surgeon. Right busy enough and taking time away from family, but I love how my career has unfolded. I'm very, very grateful for it. And there are just so many people that have contributed to that. So yeah, I'm Keith Matheny. I'm a private practice community otolaryngologist in Dallas, North Dallas. And my practice, I've been out of my training at Vanderbilt for 20 plus years, 21, 22 years. And I mostly now do rhinology and sleep. Uh, sleep disorders where the nose is involved. So that's mostly adults, but some kids too. And my uh, journey into these other forays, these other companies really was very gradual and and stepwise, Uh, but I'm very thankful for it, as I said. So leaving Vanderbilt, I joined two wonderful physicians. One is still practicing with me today. Uh, He's high up in the leadership of some of our national organizations. The founding partner of my practice, which is 50 plus years old, has retired. And like most of our colleagues, obviously, uh, you and I, Dr. Block, are otolaryngologists, but like really any physician, we went to school until our early to mid 30s and focused on healthcare, not really anything on business. And when we finally finished our training, we we're unleashed on these multi million dollar businesses with really little experience in how to run them, certainly how to run them well. And the practice I joined was no different. It was flourishing from a patient flow standpoint. Uh, We were in a thriving suburb, and even my first week of practice, just the overflow from my two partners. I had 50 new patients, and so was, was doing surgery, even my second week in practice. But really, everywhere that I looked around, uh, was an opportunity for improvement. Is that a tactful way to say it? Uh, Meaning we were busy in spite of our surroundings, in spite of our infrastructure. Sorry, let's just pause there for a second because something that we're seeing with with hiring um, is that we're seeing more people joining academic practices, more people joining multi-specialty practices, more people joining these larger groups so that unlike in your situation where you had to figure out how to run the business, that's something that they don't need to worry about. And so do you think that it's that daunting possibility? Like, holy cow, I'm going to need to do all of these things that I have no idea how to do, or it's trepid, like trepidation, or is it like, I have no interest in doing that. So I just want to put my head down and see patients. I'll let someone else take care of it. So I'm going to join a giant practice. Like, do you think it's lack of interest or fear or, or that's not even part of the decision-making that's driving some away from private practice and into the larger academic practices? That's a great, great question. And I haven't really been asked that. I'm fortunate to be on a lot of these types of of productions. I think, in my opinion, and I bet you're a little bit younger than me, I think it may go back to differences in expectations um, in all around the the decision to limit residency work hours, perhaps, uh, I think that gave younger physicians a much healthier perspective on where their career fits in their whole life. Um, I'm probably, in fact, when I graduated from Vanderbilt, the very next day is when the 80-hour work week went into effect back in 2003. And I feel like that was a paradigm shift uh, in a positive way. I'm being complimentary. While I don't regret my training, I, I'm so 
amazed at, at what I was exposed to. It was tough. It was tough working 100, 120, 140 hours a week, sometimes on cardiac surgery rotation. And I feel like those that came after me had a much healthier balance. Uh, they still are and were very committed to learning patient care, uh, but they realized that that was in the context of their entire life. And so maybe where you're going and leading me with that question is a healthier perspective on just that, that yes, it's, it's okay to partner with business people. I'll let them run things uh, where I can just focus on patient care. Where I worry though, is that blurring of the line of managing healthcare practices, specifically physician practices, and where the business sides of things begin to affect patient care decisions. Yeah. That's what makes me nervous. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that that's, you know, that's one of my, I wasn't planning on this conversation going there, but that, you know, that's what, one of my trepidations with, with private equity buying up um, pra private practices is now you're beholden, you know, like you, the, the ultimate, like they, you, they want to keep their physicians, right? They want to keep their physicians happy. Otherwise they're not going to leave. They're, they're not going to say they're not going to recruit. Um, but ultimately the bottom line is king, which is certainly important in a practice, but physician um, happiness is king when you're, when you're running the practice, like, oh, we can make a bunch more money if we take a bunch of call. Wow. But that's really going to suck. So like, <laughs> just, you know, the, the yeah. decisions are, 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 are a little different. They're not always about the money. And that's actually something that I, that, that I wanted to ask you later um, with your, with your practice management consulting um, right, is, right. is, is when you are, so hey, why don't we get to us? We'll just get to it now. So, so yeah. one, so well, first tell us what US ENT Partners is, and then we'll we'll get to that. Yeah. US ENT Partners in name is a group purchasing organization that is a formal legal structure, a GPO is the acronym, where we have a group of physicians. In this case, it's it's a single specialty, it's ENT physicians, although we do some allergists and sleep physicians that purchase with us. And just like one of these large big box companies, Costco, Sam's Club, because we have a large group of physicians buying a specific widget, a specific technology or device, we're able to command much better pricing on that than we could as individuals. So usc and is a GPO, but the spirit, the heart of it came out of practice consulting uh, that that I started doing 15 years ago based upon mostly mistakes that I made at taking over my practice early on, uh, good guesses that I made, things that I learned however I got there, and then extrapolating those to colleagues in my, my geographic area and then nationally. So it is a GPO, but it really, our mission is to aid and abet physicians to run better businesses so that they can remain independent and only partner with private equity, hospital systems, what have you, on their own terms when it makes sense for them from a business standpoint rather than to avoid going bankrupt. Yeah, under and duress. Unfortunately, yeah. that's what's well, under duress. Yeah, that's the usual case, right? So I love where you're taking this, yeah. So it started off as a practice management consulting firm. You turned your own practice into a well-oiled machine and then people started asking you, hey, could you help me do the same thing? And ultimately you spun it off into like a consulting service and then realized, hey, you know what? We can do this group purchasing, get the leverage of these people that I'm consulting with, you know, get leverage over the uh, device companies and equipment companies so that we can all purchase together. And then that became its own company. Right, so that's what us and Partners is. Couldn't have said it better myself, exactly. And, and you know, in our specialty, obviously, you and I are otolaryngologists, so I know many different physicians and many different audience members are out there. But our specialty has really undergone a renaissance of transition of site of service. So over the last fifteen years, starting with balloon sinusoplasty, but many, many, many other things since then, I have transitioned into the office, and that's made our specialty exquisitely expensive to practice. 
uh, and the reimbursement hasn't caught up with it. Most of the procedures that we do, we're reimbursed based upon a hospital or facility-based system. Right. When we do sinus surgery, you and I do sinus surgery. The hospital is, receives X amount. The ASC re receives less, but a heck of a lot more than when you and I do cases in the office where there is no facility fee. All we have, have is our professional fees, no matter where we're performing that service. And so the necessity of group purchasing an ENT is, and, and other specialties too, is really paramount. So when you were building US ENT partners, what's, if you had to go back and do it again, what's just one thing, two things you would have done differently? Yeah. So the first iteration of this, you know, once we said, hey, what, what would a national platform for this practice consulting company look like? We thought about doing a private equity roll-up. And for those who may not be familiar that are listening, uh, that's a situation where uh, a private equity group, a group of investors comes in and buys either part or all of a medical practice. And the goal is for them to provide economies of scale, business expertise, management, and to let the physicians therefore just focus on patient care. And it's, you know, kumbaya, happy partnership where the business is humming along. The physicians are, are doing great. Um, and it, in many cases, it works well. In many cases, it doesn't. Uh, in the ENT space, it's very early. Um, now, the 10 years ago, the first version of USCNT was an attempt to do that. And our specialty just wasn't ready for a variety of reasons. So that's when we pivoted um, to become a GPO, which took a while. But the answer to your question is what, what would I do differently is I would have started with forming the GPO if I had known then what I know now. Yeah, it seems like a nat natural way to then incorporate other practices under your umbrella, right? Like, oh, you know what? Why don't we take care of payroll for you too? Oh, why don't we take care of, you know, you can outsource this other stuff. And instead of them, them uh <laughs> This is kind of a negative spin, but it's like, how do you boil a frog, right? Slowly. So instead right. of the, the right. practice giving up all their autonomy at the same time and being opposed to it, they're giving off all of their pain points first, and then you can kind of slowly, you know, uh, accelerate the process as they get, get more comfortable with giving up more and more of the control of, of mostly things that they probably don't want to be doing anyway. Right. And don't want to be and, and aren't able to do very well. Again, uh, most of us go to school till we're 32, 33 years old and have never had three credit hours of business while. And, and so that's not what we want to do. We want to care for our patients. We want to operate. We want to um, do these types of things. And so, yeah, and that, well, I hope it's not truly boiling a frog. I know you're, you're using that in jest. Um, that's absolutely true. I want to create an environment where the physician practice is still free and sovereign, and yet the business is really efficient because of cost savings, because we've helped them implement new revenue opportunities, new lines of business, new service lines, and then helped them run better businesses in the back office. So those are the three pillars, again, all aimed at keeping the physician's ability to be independent and make independent patient care decisions. This podcast is sponsored by Doc to Doc Lending, the personal lending platform for doctors by doctors. Traditional lenders overestimate the risk of lending to doctors because a lot of us carry significant debt. But at Doc to Doc, they know that as a profession, doctors almost never default on their loans, and they take that in consideration when they're setting our rates. I love what Doc to Doc is doing within our community, so please check them out at doctodoclending.com slash PGTD. That's Doc to Doc Lending number two slash PGTD for Physician's Guide to Doctoring. So one of the the, the questions I was getting to earlier before we got into what USCNT Partners is all about was when you're doing your practice management consulting, right? And you're making recommendations for how practices can be run better. What have been any recommendations that you've made that were more for quality of life than the bottom line, right? Like allowing them to 
do things more efficiently, see more patients in a shorter period of time, like get home earlier, take less, you know, something that's not about money, but more about a better life. Yeah. I think of two things right off the bat. So in one kind of checks both boxes where it improves the bottom line, uh, but really improves quality of life. And that would be the proper utilization of mid-level providers. So I'd like to talk about that. But something more prescient to me, as I sit here, um, just finishing clinic and not remotely done with my charging for the day, uh, scribes or, or, and not maybe a technical scribe, but someone that performs that service for us. There's been such an upward delegation in healthcare, right? Uh, it makes sense in political circles and, uh, you know, third party payer circles. Well, let's ask the doctor to do this. Even even the fact that now our uh, delegates in our office cannot prescribe or refill narcotics. All right. So you and I, when we do tonsillectomies, at least in the state of Texas, we can only prescribe seven days worth of hydrocodone. Well, in adult tonsillectomy, that's not enough. So if I do a tonsillectomy and I happen to be out of town on the eighth day, no matter where I am on the other side of the world, it has to be me emailing in a prescription with two-factor verification for a couple more hydrocodone tablets. But the biggest upper delegation was this decision that we all had to go to electric, electronic charting, and we have to meet all these uh, quality standards and this, that, and the other. And it has added hours to our day, and it has reduced the number of patients that we can actually care for because there are things that the top of the heap, if you will, the physician has to do themselves that can't be delegated to anybody else. Well, I'd like to direct you to two of my prior episodes with Sarah Smith and <laughs> Junaid Niazi, both of which were about charting efficiently and getting home on time. So those have definitely helped me to get my charting done on time. So, but, but, but what they didn't touch on is supervising the mid-level or, or the... Uh, uh, practice extent, uh, you know, yeah. it, so, so, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, they didn't cover that. So if that's what you're referring to, that you've got to oversee all of their charts and do all that at the end of the day, I could see, yeah, that would really, yeah. Extend your day. Yeah. But, but overall they're, they're a blessing, right? Yeah. And it's, it's the way that we can deliver healthcare like we used to seeing tons of patients, um, we just have to, like all is true in all areas of life, we have to grow and adapt and pivot. So for me, my, my mid-level provider is invaluable. Uh, we actually have two in our practice and we have four physicians right now. Uh, so they are our scribes, if you will. So when we see a new patient, the first person that the patient meets is one of our mid-level providers. And they go in there, they populate the chart, they make sure we have the the lab test and the radiology test and everything, they collate all the data, kind of like when you and I were mid-level residents, you know, maybe third or fourth year residents. Yeah. They present the case to the, to the physician. This is what they think, et cetera. So by the time I go into the room, the data has been gathered. Most of the charting has been completed. And I can actually sit there and, and chit chat with the patient for a few moments. What a, what a concept, right? Like it, we used to 10, 20, 30 years ago. Get to know the patient confirm the history, confirm the physical exam, finalize the plan. And what helps there is that the patient met and developed a relationship with the physician, but they also met the mid-level provider. So we see a lot less blowback when the patients follow up for non-acute issues with the mid-level provider because they feel like that person was part of the initial encounter and the initial plan. That frees me then up, you know, at three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whenever the follow-up appointment is, to be seeing another new patient, to be doing a procedure, to be doing a higher level acuity visit. So I feel like I've somewhat cloned myself and I'm able to see two clinic schedules for one, uh, more or less. So I can spend my day seeing new patients, reviewing CT scans, thyroid ultrasounds, whatever I have and doing procedures while simultaneously my physician assistant, and, and we've had nurse practitioners too, both are excellent. My physician assistant is doing a lot of the follow-ups, 
checking with me. I can poke my head in the room. Obviously, I'm responsible for their charts, you know, whether I'm able to see the patient that day or not. I have to oversee and sign those off. But that allows me to, again, see the number of patients that I used to 20 plus years ago when I had paper charts and things were much quicker. Uh, so that's been a huge quality of life improvement. That individual can also, and they do, take call when I'm on call. So they can triage and, and the things that can wait till the next morning, they can put them off if they're simple medication refills, things like that. So even when I'm on call, my quality of life is so much better than it used to be. Because I'm only, I'm only really contacted when I need to do something, when I need to go to the hospital, I need to take someone back to the OR. So that's been huge, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a true revenue generator that has also dramatically improved my quality of life. What I've seen around the country is a lot of different models using mid-level providers, some more effectively than others. And I have seen a lot of different scribe options because, again, this medical record keeping is so important, but it's very onerous. Yeah, very we onerous. have a, we've we've done a lot of episodes on scribes, in person scribes, virtual scribes, um, scribes that are you know there remotely on the computer but not physically present. Those that that check your chart later and and do the document. Yeah, there are lots of iterations on on scribes, and I think we've talked about all. All of them uh, in other episodes, so we don't we don't need to go down that uh, yeah. down that rabbit hole. Um, but but um, so I guess that really answers the the next question too, which would have been what's the you know what are the highest return on investment changes? So what you said really one it's quality of life and two it's it's financial uh, as well is is really utilizing those those mid level providers most uh, most efficiently. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, you can pay them you know, a good salary. And, and usually most of us will do a, a hybrid of, of base salary and commission. Um, but it still does add revenue over and above that to the practice. Um, beyond what you could do yourself, even if you were doing clinic 24 seven. Yeah. Uh, so it's definitely good for the bottom line. And our specialty specific, and again, I'm being sensitive, the audience is much broader than just your nose and throat. There's only 5,000 ENT doctors in the United States that are in the community practice. Uh, but in our specialty, you know, I think about in-office diagnostics too. So uh, CT scanners uh, in states that allow that, but radiology, many of us are doing PCR, not just for COVID, but for our sinus bugs, for our, our strep testing. Uh, so in-office diagnostics, which for you and I includes sleep, uh, sleep apnea has its own podcast. We'll talk here in a minute about, about some of that. But so those kind of ancillary services, bringing those in-house is so much more convenient for the patient. There's a lot better follow through uh, in those patients receiving those tests and then acting upon them. Uh, so that's another one that I, I preach all the time to practices is bringing things in house when yeah. possible. So, so you decided that, um, running this company was, wasn't enough us ENT partners. And what we're not going to end up discussing is the, is the device development. You're also involved with that. So on top of all that, you're like, you know what? I, uh, it takes me, you know, a couple minutes to fall asleep in that time. I could start another company. Oh, Hey, sleep. <laughs> It'll be a sleep company. Perfect. So, so you started Sleep Vigil. So, tell us about what Sleep Vigil is. Yeah. Well, I'm so fortunate. I mean, it's beyond the scope of this particular talk, but I just have had so much serendipity, so many amazing people in my path that continues the, the bigger the path becomes. Sleep Vigil is a remote patient monitoring software platform. It's really an app. And what it does is it takes data from a variety of devices, medical grade devices, even consumer wearables, in a HIPAA compliant way into our chart so we can monitor our sleep apnea patients. This, even though I'm a, a rhinologist, a glorified booger picker, right? Uh, the nose is very involved in sleep, so sleep has become a passion of mine, primarily because we as a physician community beyond ENT, pulmonologists and neurologists, all three of us, do a lousy job caring for this very severe disease. 
about 25% of the people walking around on this planet have diagnosable or obstructive sleep apnea, meaning the airway is collapsing on a routine basis while we're asleep and dropping our oxygen levels. And that has major implications long-term. Cardiovascular system, the neurological system, including development of dementia, daytime uh, drowsy driving, which is as bad as drunk driving, on them. And we're doing a terrible job caring for this patient. The sleep vigil addresses that. If you asked me, if you and I had done this podcast before COVID, even just five years ago, you said, Keith, is, is sleep a big part of your practice? I would say, absolutely. What I meant then is that I saw a lot of people that their spouses dragged them in by their ear because they were snoring. And I was simply a triage person. I would do a physical exam and send them off to a sleep lab to have a sleep study and most of the time never see them again. And so the first step that we did was bring the diagnostics in-house and start doing home sleep testing where I would review the results with the patient. And I know your practice does this too. And the patients loved that because they had already developed the relationship with me. And so we would decide, okay, you're you're a candidate for CPAP, you're a candidate for surgery, you're a candidate for oral appliance, what have you. I have one payer, and it's 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 a Medicaid, managed Medicaid, and they've decided that they're not going to reimburse for a home sleep, t- home sleep test. They're like, no, you have to do it in a sleep lab. They've decided that, you know what, we'd like to pay 10 times as much for each sleep study. That's how we want to <laughs> yeah. do it. That's our patients are on Medicaid, and we're going to save them money by spending 10 times as much on a sleep test, it's, it's crazy. But yeah, there are some holdouts out there. But yeah, my, for my practice, the overwhelming majority are getting are getting the, the the home sleep studies. So we get their home sleep studies. We make their the the, the recommendations. And so if if I, if I understand sleep vigil correctly, once the patient's sleep apnea is being managed, um, in one way or another, right? Whether it's surgical or CPAP or, or oral appliance, mandibular advancement device. Uh, in, inspire. Um, so yeah, in, in some definitely. way, then you're able to keep tabs on them because right now the only way that we can keep tabs on our patients is, is the CPAP patients because they're either using their CPAP machine or, or, or they're not, they're using it for a few hours, right? We get, it's connected by like Bluetooth or a modem or whatever. And, and then we can, we can get their compliance report, but for anyone else, um, we're not, we're asking them, yeah. right? So we're asking their bed yeah, You get one sleep test to see different? if it's working, and right. it worked that one night, but we're not getting any other information. So you found a way to collect in a similar way to like the Apple tags that you can put in your luggage to find <laughs> to find your lost luggage. Like it's, it's right. taking advantage of the phone that's already there putting out information. So now you can find your luggage. So you're taking advantage of the fact that these patients are already wearing these devices and it's collecting information. Great. Let's use it. That's an excellent analogy because it's a way to do a poor man's sleep study every night yeah. instead of what most payers allow us to do is every three years. Yeah. That's not okay. I mean, again, this is not the sniffles. This is not some minor disease. Sleep apnea is a fatal disease but then how over a period of time how are these how are you able to build because because the devices that sync with S- sleep vigil are like your apple watch or garmin device your those those rings um these are not fda approved devices that may not have the same fidelity as an an fda approved oxygen sat monitor so how you know, I thought we have to use FDA approved devices to be able to bill for, you know, data collection and hey, anything. Yeah, and, exactly. Anything, anything. even the TV screen in the operating right. room has to be an FDA approved television for your scopes. Hey, so true. Well, it comes down. I'm far from a lawyer, but um, you know the the vignette on these CPT codes. So there are remote patient monitoring codes that came into vogue uh, during the telemedicine. Um, you know, increase during COVID. And so there are five codes. And when you look at the letter of the law and you interpret it, it, these are devices that are FDA cleared. And that seems like uh, splitting hairs, but it's very different. Um, And so there are a variety of FDA approved oxygen monitors. The problem with 
most of them is their spot checks. If you think about it, you have to be awake and either put the monitor on your finger yourself or have somebody do it. We want to see what's going on in all stages of sleep. So we really need continuous monitoring. And so we, in the lack thereof of an FDA approved continuous oxygen monitor, we have moved ahead by using these things. Now, the Apple Watch in particular is FDA approved for EKG uh, and detection of some arrhythmias wow. like V-fib. And so we feel like we're helping to find a solution here because we just have a dearth of continuous SpO2 monitors. And yet we see the importance of having that capability. So uh, with a CPAP patient, there is a plug-in that can be put on to monitor oxygen level. Otherwise, we just get their utilization data and a derived apnea, hypopnea index. And uh, the field is early. I mean, it, what exactly what parameters can be built for remote patient monitoring? We know in the cardiology space that blood pressure readings can. We know the bariatric space that weight can be. We know in endocrinology, blood sugars can be. And so we're really trying to build that out in concert with the payers on what that looks like uh, because of the gravity of what we're monitoring. I just completed a trial. I haven't published the data yet, but in a cohort of my oral appliance patients, most of whom, thankfully, were managed very well by my sleep dentist, who again comes into my office. It's all in-house. But a few weren't. And they would have guessed, and I would have guessed, that they were they were being treated excellent. So this is the small fragment of patients that we are caring for. And so the nightly monitoring, I was able to make tweaks and um, improve their oxygenation throughout the day. So the importance of this cannot be understated. So how are you using that data? Like how is that how is that working? So you're it you you have a device that syncs to their device and that stays in their house and then it sends you the data? Like how is this working? Yeah, for any for any RPM, you know, you might see people at the gym that have something stuck in their arm. That's monitoring their blood glucose. So the data, in other words, let's talk about a hypertension patient. They can't take their blood pressure, write it on a sticky note, and drop it off with the medical assistant at the office. The, the data has to be objective from an electronic device and transmitted electronically where, the, uh, where it's unadulterated data. And it comes into the physician's chart where the physician can, or his, his or her delegates can interact with that data um, for 20 minutes a month, 40 minutes a month, or different codes that you can bill and then make clinical adjustments as necessary. So for me, to answer your question, I have a, a dashboard that shows me the oxygen curve in each night. And so I can review that. And when we see a preponderance of, of hypoxia, we know that we need to intervene that patient. Okay. So you're looking at each night rather, it's not like a, it's, there's a, a computer algorithm that like collates the the nights and lets you know when there's an outlier or lets you know when someone's in a, uh, there are, there are those kind of functionalities, okay. but to meet the, but you don't even need to be that sophisticated to meet the criteria for remote patient monitoring. Got it. You just need to review the data and have a two way communication with the patient on what that data looks like and make any clinical adjustments. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's great. Yeah, I do. I do a lot of sleep myself in my practice and, uh, and yeah, it's just, how's it going? <laughs> Is your significant other complaining about your snoring anymore? No, you're feeling better. Here's your up with sleepiness scale. You know, you know, yeah, with sleep, yeah. with CPAP, we do get feedback. But if it's any, anything else, like I, you know, I have patients and I'm sure you do too, where their sleep apnea is insanely positional. They have like awful sleep apnea when they're supine and they have no sleep apnea when they're not supine. And you can give them like a, a, a wearable device I'm going to plug some companies here like the slumber bump or the, the remedy or the Zoma, right? So they can remain right. non supine, but then you're just hoping that they wear it, hoping that it works, hoping they don't end up supine, yeah. you know, like hoping that right. they're, that they're, they're doing well. Certainly oxygenation is only one aspect of sleep apnea, yeah, for but, sure. but at the same for time, sure. it's, there's, you know, there's data out there that says that, uh, you know, desaturations may even be more significant than, um, 
AHI, apnea hypopnea index on some of the health co outcomes that we're discussing. So yeah, this, right. is, uh, right. this, is, this is a lot of important data. And now you have a way to catch it. So yeah, that's, and that just speaks to the, the wonder of our specialty, right? I mean, we, ENT cares for such a broad variety of patients. That's, that's what I love. That's what attracted me in medical school to begin with, um, was, you know, we see preemies to elderly males, females, we do clinic, we do surgery, we care for these disease states. In fact, from many perspectives, the disease states that you and I care for are economically the most impact. Think about sleep apnea, think about hearing loss and its correlation to dementia. Think about even ear infections in little kids keep so many parents out of the workplace on a daily basis. Allergies and the decreased performance, uh, again, sleep. Yeah, I read something like 50% of emergency department visits are somehow related to, if you include headaches in there, um, and that's like a separate conversation with the whole balloon thing, but uh, if you include headaches in there, then, um, right. you know, it's like 50% of of emergency department or urgent care visits are somehow otolaryngology, ear nose related. So, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, we're pretty amazing. What can I say? We are. <laughs> What can we say, right? What can we say? <laughs> okay, so we're we're winding down, and we didn't we did not um, touch on the device development, but I do want to ask you just one question because I've heard you say it in other podcasts, and so I, I want you to share it with with my audience, and that's your um, perspective on patents. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's that is such a great bit of information, such a great bit of advice on if you've got a great idea. What do you do next? Yeah, exactly. So it's very easy. It seems daunting, perhaps, just because, again, our education doesn't teach us how to do this as physicians. But it's very easy to protect ideas. Um, so don't do what I did, you know, when you have a bright idea and you start talking to other people. Thankfully, I was mostly treated very ethically and honestly. But um, when you do have a good idea, document it. Get on Google, search Google Patents, get on uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website. It's very easy to use and extensive. See what has already been protected. There are millions of patents that have been issued since the 1780s when the USPTO was founded. And then if you feel like you have something that's unique, um, you can try to do it yourself. But it's nice to get an IP intellectual property attorney involved and just file it. It's like everything in life. Just start. Just take the first step. You don't have to have this perfect graphical drawing in this perfect document. Just file it because it's all about the priority date. It's all about the date that you pay the fee to file. And then you have pretty, pretty good protection to then talk to industry partners and talk to investors about developing them. Um, as physicians, yeah, I want us all to help each other with these ideas and to protect them. And uh, so that's step one before you share it with anyone outside your closest friend. And I think it, it says a lot to whoever you're proposing the idea to that, like, you've got your act together so much that you've already put in for the Great patent. Point. Like, they're, they're going to give you a lot more credibility and be more willing to listen to your idea if, like, you've taken that step because it shows that even if you don't know what you're doing, it at least appears that you know what you're doing. And that's all that matters. Exactly. Um, great points. So uh, where if, if people want to find you online, if, uh, if they want your you know, purchasing services or consulting services, uh, how can they find you? How can they find you online? Well, yeah, just reach out to me. Probably the best platform is on LinkedIn. Uh, so I have, I manage it myself and, and uh, message folks all the time. Uh, love, love that medium. And it would be honored to help anyone uh, that has further questions about any of these things. Wonderful. Dr. Keith Matheny, thanks, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Block. I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you next time I'm up, up there. Thanks for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast player. I'm also available for medical legal consulting and keynote speaking if you're interested. Or to just give us some feedback on the show, email me at brad at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com. I'll see you next week. Thank you.
The ideas expressed in this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers.